Hello and welcome to the DIFF, the Disruptive Innovation Festival. This is day four of our three-week online festival that asks the question, what if we could redesign everything? I am very excited to introduce in this session to Galit Goldfarb from Israel. Uh, Galit has 22 years experience is, as a um, nutritionist, as a, as a clinical nutritionist and scientist especially in the food and diet and lifestyle program. And we will have an open discussion or conversation about a couple of questions, crucial questions for what will happen uh, with feeding 10 billion people in the future. And um, Galit really knows how food choices affect every aspect of our being, not just individually, but what the bigger impact could be and can be on uh, for our future. So, uh, Gali, great to have you here. Thanks very much for joining us for the DIV. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and I'm, um, I'm really intrigued by this topic to, to see, um, as we discussed it before and as we connected, that what could be you know, the global approach to food and diet, dietary choice and what, what education can do in this space or what is necessary to, necessarily to be done. Yeah, well, um, that's a great question because, um, first of all, it's good to understand why, whether it's really necessary to redesign uh, the global approach to food and okay. diet choices. Um, and um, I sent you a slide. Uh, yeah. You can actually put it up because let's look at some statistics. Um, research shows that the human population is growing uh, at a rate of 360,000 births every day. And there are only 180,000 deaths per day. So the population is growing. It's predicted to reach 8.5 billion people by 2030 and 9.7 billion by 2050. Um, and then go up and to reach 10.5 billion people by 2060. And with our current food choices, that we're, how we're eating today, um, the growing population, we're going to need to grow 70% more food than we are growing now. So we will need to grow more, more food. And the statistics also show uh, that um, through our current patterns of behavior, um, uh, how we're living, um, we're going to be uh, also, with, with, it's also leading to 17% less productivity from our land. We're, we're causing um, land degradation. So even the amount of uh, land that we do have available to grow our food is, is degrading. And um, in the last 40 years, we lost about a third of our arable land due to land degradation. And it's happening because of uh, poor resource management. We're uh, growing a lot of meat for co consumption and biofuel. And this is also, um, uh, now we're only 55% of the world's crops are nourishing actually people. Uh, about 100 calories of grain, which is fed to animals, um, only, we only get about 40 calories if we're drinking milk from a cow, 22 calories if we're eating an egg, 12 calories if we're eating a chicken, and only 3 calories of that 100 calorie grain, um, we, we eat it back as beef. So um, uh, all of these, uh, and also unsustainable farming practices are, are leading to land degradation, uh, excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides. So we need to change our habitual behaviors as well as grow more food. And we also have um, about 820 million starving people on the planet. Mm. And uh, that's one in eight uh, people are undernourished. And 46% of children are underweight. And on the other hand, we have 1.9 billion people uh, that are overweight, and 600 people, uh, 600,000 people are obese. So also we have um, the whole issue of distribution. How can we distribute the, this food to people equally if we want to feed all people in this growing population? Uh, and and also we want to feed them healthily. So we have. Um, Another sh shocking statistic, I think, is, and that's that 95% of the global population uh, um, is living in suboptimal health uh, conditions. Uh, so uh, just one in 20 people actually has no health problems, which is, uh, <laughs> and, and most- one out of, yeah, yeah, one out of 20. 20, yeah, that's 4.3% of the population has no health problems. One third of our population has more than five health issues at once. So, 
we need to change our dietary habits as well. So we have all of these issues if we want to feed um, the world population. So we definitely need to redesign our global approach to food and dietary habits, and we should start to do this immediately. Mm. So and should we, should, should we do it with, um, with, with you know, children or um, ad, uh, sort of teenagers, or how can we, how can we implement that from, from, from start, from scratch? I remember I wouldn't have learned much about this when I was younger. Exactly. Yes, so definitely compulsory sustainable environmental education in schools is a must. We, the, 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 the children of the, they need to know what's really happening. Um, the problem is that we have global warming on one side, which is causing uh, uh, loss of land and people will have to migrate out of where they're living to, to be able to grow and have enough food. And on the other hand, we have this population growth, so we're going to mm -hmm. have more people to feed. So we need to care for global uh, warming to make sure that we, we don't uh, go over the another, now we've set for ourselves another two degree uh, limit. We have to make sure that we don't go over that so we can have uh, the possibility to feed all these people and that we don't have the destruction and so many people will, will die and we'll see a massive immigration, climate immigrations happening and refugees from climate. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely we need education, we need um, places uh, to, to get the information about which food mm -hmm. is sustainable, which food is not, and um, uh, my website shows a little bit of information, but uh, education is still not enough. Yeah. Um, because most... It's mostly about know, consciousness as well, is that something you would say it could create a wider impact yeah. if, I mean... Um, we we can't have everyone go vegetarian, or I, I guess it's very unlikely. You probably see the same. So we, we, there might be solutions to this. Um, I mean, I'm sometimes a bit startled when you think about uh, lab-grown meats or the like. You know, we try we need to try to stay natural. I think this is something that you advocate as well. Um, that we that we don't we we can't go over industrialized on our foods. Um, so. While some may need meat or still want to eat meat or still have their own choices, um, how can a conscious approach? Um, how can a conscious approach to to dietary choice or to meat have a wider impact on the economy? Okay, first of all, I want I want to say that um, most of our uh, food choices are are actually done unconsciously without paying much attention to what we're eating why we're eating it <laughs> or anything. We're, we're doing these choices uh, mostly out of habit. And we make about 200 food decisions a day, uh, research shows, and all of this is done through habit. We may go to a supermarket and mostly we buy all of our, all of our food mm -hmm. uh, through habit and uh, maybe some impulse here, but uh, none of it is really done consciously. So once we start educating um, children and people, um, then of course this will change. Also, there, there, um, there are what's called nudges, so people can have like, instead of, um, uh, they go into a fast food restaurant, so instead of having fries as a side dish, they'd have salad or, or having eye level foods uh, in supermarkets and have them more accessible, but, but still the, the um, the most important thing is price uh, because people are buying food according to their prices and 40% um, uh, of the United States population is below poverty line and most of these people live in places where they don't even have access to healthy food. So they're what's called food deserts um, where they, they have... Um, they have one convenience store and they don't have access to too much uh, public transportation. They don't own a car or, and um, then they have to buy what's local and what's local uh, in these places is um, these shops can't buy in bulk. They don't have much buying power. So these, they, they bring in uh, foods that can last for a long time. Uh, lots of food storage, uh, uh, processed foods that can last for a long time. So they put them in the back room there of the convenience store and, that, and that's what they sell because that's what people are also buying. They're also the cheapest foods. Now, um, uh, we can give incentives to full service supermarkets to open in these areas while uh, this, this will provide more variety for people and also, uh, on the other hand, um, 
um, have fast food free zones where these fast food restaurants won't be able to open in in neighborhoods uh, um, and then uh, these supermarkets will also be able to sell more food but then we have this also the snap program in the united states these food stamps which is a wonderful program uh, it, it really it also stimulates an economic activity while um when uh, when there's an economic downturn but um, the problem with these uh, it's a wonderful program but there is one drawback and that's the foods that they can buy they can actually buy any any type of foods that they want and that includes uh, candy soft drinks you know cookies cakes and all these bakery goods as well as meat and dairy products which is okay but I think that if you're you're giving um, uh, these food stamps to, to populations, you also want to make them healthier. You don't want to have it then come back through the back door and uh, get in through the health care that, that we're, we're having to, to pay um, through taxes. So uh, that's definitely something that will we'll need a little bit of changing, I think, and also, of course, school feeding programs like they have in France. The school, they get wonderful, healthy foods, um, healthy foods there. And, um, and uh, okay, so, so you asked me about meat. <laughs> well, yeah, consuming, uh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I nope. can't. There you go, a little glitch. Oh, no, Sorry about no, that. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, meat is something to think about given we consume quite a lot of it these days and we get so used to consuming it. But um, I think moving on to the next questions or kind of you already bridged to the next question saying, uh, talking about the 10 billion people, um, what can be done from bottom up approach? And you mentioned the food stamps um, and I could see that there might be um, other projects or ideas out there to support these goals from, you know, to feed a healthy society in the future. Um, do you have any projects in mind or, in mind or any examples that you could think of? Um, yeah, well, actually, you, you you were speaking about making meat in a lab, or that's something that people are going about. But actually, um, there are many projects that can be done, but what people can personally do is, first of all, is change their eating habits. And this is very important, because although we know that um, the greenhouse gases the glo the glo were, were causing global warming, and these... Um, greenhouse gases carbon dioxide it's it's uh, capturing the the sunlight and then sending it back to the earth it's warming up our planet but and we know that a uh, 60% is coming from carbon dioxide from heating the house and from um, I'll, screen, wait, I'll I'll share the screen because you've also got a good summary on this one second if that helps you one. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so 14 <laughs> of our, yeah, actually, so 14% of our global greenhouse gas comes from uh, the livestock industry. Now, um, the thing is with the, these animals, ruminants, especially the cows, um, um, that they put out, instead of not carbon dioxide, they have through their digestive system methane. And methane is a, a more potent greenhouse gas by 25% than carbon dioxide. So actually, um, uh, if you if you do 14.5 percent times 25 you'll have a much higher number than the whole industry of the, the industry uh, that's putting up carbon um, into the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere now not only that um, carbon dioxide uh, lasts for about uh, between 20 and a thousand years so mm -hmm. most people say it's about a, a hundred years in the atmosphere methane thank goodness only lasts about 30 years uh, 20 to 30 years so that's good news so if we start making the change we'll start seeing uh, the change yeah. pretty soon but the thing is that if you put together um, the effect of, of methane you, you instead of a hundred years you put it down to the 20 or 30 years you'll see that it's 70 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide so really um now 2016 was the warmest year uh, in recorded history so the best approach is first of all changing our diets and um uh when we when we do that uh, uh it will really change maybe you can show uh the next slide uh, yeah essentially that's the last slide i think um uh 
with a plast, uh, plant based diet effects. Yeah, effects. exactly. Yeah. So let's yeah. see that. In a second, yeah. Also, there is um, something important is the different types of meat have different, different, um, uh, are, are different in sustainable choices. So anyway, let's look at this, you see. So everyone, if everyone in the world followed a 90% plant-based diet. So uh, my research into the ideal diet for humans shows that really 10% um, uh, of um, the diet can come from animal products um, for health and uh, the rest should be plant-based. So if you go with a plant-based diet, um, eating legumes, uh, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, nuts and seeds, and, and just 10% coming from uh, animals, so you have a savings in health costs, you know, trillion, a trillion dollars and um, 8.1 million fewer deaths per year, that's even more than the, what we see from smoking. And if everyone uh, followed a 90% plant-based diet, greenhouse gas emissions would be down 55%. Uh, so then um, we'd really be where we want to go. And, and, and also, um, I wanted to say that uh, you can take down the, the, thing, <laughs> the power. <laughs> but if, uh, there are also different types of meat. So for example, if a person would want to choose their uh, meats uh, in, in a sustainable way, then you have uh, fish that are very efficient users of, of, um, of uh, feed. Uh, for example, salmon uh, research that was done that showed that 1.1 kilo of feed um, for these salmon produces one kilo of meat. And then you have chicken, which is um, also very efficient, but um, you have um, 1.7 kilos of uh, feed producing one kilo of meat. And on the other hand, you have uh, a pig, which is about um, three kilos of feed produces one kilo of meat. But then you have a cow, which is about seven kilo of feed produces one kilo of meat. And um, also, one kilo of meat needs about the same amount of water that's needed to, for a whole household for 10 months. So this is very uh, unsustainable choice of, uh, <laughs> of calories. And um, if we'd reduce the amount of calories, mm. then, then um, we'd certainly have more agricultural land to feed. We'd have, uh, uh, today, 68% of our uh, uh, land, agricultural land, is used for livestock. So this land could be restored and made grasslands or forests. And as we know that the plants take carbon dioxide and uh, water, and with the sunlight, they make it into uh, starches and, um, and oxygen. So they'd be capturing some of these greenhouse gases. So of course, we'd have more forests and we'd have more biodiversity if we have more forests. And we could also diverge this land to feed more people. Um, uh, now, there are some things, like, like I said, as, um, as far as the eye can see, um, actually people are moving more to cities. The more they move to cities, they are consuming much more dairy products because dairy products are um, becoming so cheap because the government subsidize them <laughs> because the farmers, they are, are, they're producing so much of this uh, of, of dairy products because they're in these factory farms where you have 500 plus animals because it makes it more efficient to grow the animals and they, they bring more yield. But the problem is that they make too much. They don't, don't have pretty much anywhere to sell it to, so the price goes down. And they go into cities, they sell the, the uh, and then they want subsidies from the government. They say that, and rightly so, that the feed costs more than the milk is, is giving them, so they get subsidies from the government. And then you have the people moving to the cities, they're drinking so much uh, and eating so much dairy products. So you see a rise in the graph like this of dairy product consumption when people move to cities. Uh, so uh, we have actually people eating more meat. So like you said, uh, growing them in a lab or uh, we can also have, uh, what I would suggest is having um, on top of the carbon tax that uh, not very many politicians want to want to give it out because I understand them. They're there in office for a few years and then they're not going to be able to see the effects and people are mostly going to be angry with them. But if they give back the money, like a carbon tax, back to the people through uh, income taxes and funding, um, that would be all right. And then also put a meat tax, meat and dairy tax. This is something that I think really should okay, go in. Okay. Because 
this is a if you raise the the if you put on a tax on meat and um, even allow farmers to increase the price of this meat, then um, then uh, there's a lot meat. more awareness. If you buy something that's more expensive, then you, you exactly even even not all meat, but beef, beef because it has the most effect through the methane. So um, you'd be you'd be charging more. People could still buy it. Mm -hmm. and, they'd still be able to buy it, they just have to pay a higher price, so they won't use it as a staple food, but more rather as a treat. An addition, or as a treat, yeah. yeah. A treat, and it shouldn't mm -hmm. be done like this, because we know of, of all the harmful effects, not only on the environment, but also on our health. So the healthcare, you know, uh, bowel cancers, you have heart disease, all of these are from, um, especially the bowel cancer, from, from uh, eating too much uh, red meat uh, with their endotoxins. So adding the, yeah, yeah, no, I think there is there is actually some new developments which I'm not I'm not quite sure if I could trust, you know, a non-dairy milk produced in the lab with absolutely yeah, no exactly. lactose Only and higher milk. protein. Yeah. But in the end, it might be the best solution for especially us uh, city I don't know, but, people. But that's yeah, yeah. But, then, but then still you have the health issues. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's well, it, ca it might cause new health issues. We might just have to be aware yeah. and conscious and just as diverse in our eating habits as possible. Um, otherwise, we end up overproducing on, on that end again and, and, and causing more issues, right? Actually, what, you could, what, what could be done, what I was thinking, if you have this meat tax, then you can put it in. I know it's been done. Um, it hasn't been done as a meat tax, but what I um, know is uh, governments could put that money back into helping farmers um, transform their, uh, I know in Switzerland one farm uh, he had livestock and then he started to, um, uh, with, with an oat making company, Oatly, the, he started to grow uh, crops for the, to produce this oat milk instead of only having it to feed his livestock. So that, that was helped through government um, help. So there are things to go about and, and we can, I'm a vegan, I'm a vegan, so we don't really need to eat uh, meat. I do it for um, uh, more for um, humanitarian purposes. But, um, Still, I, I, I take a vitamin supplements when I need, but um, people can eat the meat, the 10% meat, if if they really um, and and then pay a little bit more, and then it's also because actually, if you think about it, then we're subsidizing this um, this meat by not um, the governments are subsidizing this meat by not having us pay for what it really costs the world. So uh, people that are selling the meat are earning this, and nobody's really paying for what it's costing the world. Yeah, they're not pricing in um, yeah. what comes with it in terms of emissions and and the things that you've you've shown quite effectively um, in, in anyway, your summaries as well. Yeah, as well. Uh, I have also I forgot. There's also a picture of the food, uh, uh, the food pyramid. So if you, if if you yeah. can put that up. Um, yeah. One second. Actually, if we would subsidize, if governments uh, like this is this is the my um, my food pyramid. Um, uh, so you see, this is one on the one side. It's uh, the USDA food pyramid plotted in a chart, and the other side is the, uh, based on my research into the ideal diet for humans. So it's 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 pretty much similar. You just see the differences. The the dairy products are missing, and you have more legumes. Um, but the other stuff is pretty much the same. And uh, grains, of course, I I I, I should say that they're. Um, whole grains rather than uh, the USDA says half of it should go for whole grains but if you subsidize food the USDA subsidizes food then maybe sh they should subsidize it based on what what they're saying so you have this um, uh, food pyramid so subsidize it according to that now uh, five percent is going to uh, vegetables and fruits uh, whereas they they form here in the my pyramid about 20 you have 15 percent uh, the fruits and then the the vegetables uh, 20 I think 20 percent 23 percent or I can't really see it's so it's small <laughs> but yeah you put them together then you have uh, about 35 percent and they're getting only five percent whereas the dairy and meat industry is getting much more than the 23 plus seven so you have this 30 percent it's getting much more subsidies so <laughs> if you change the subsidies to go at least by the food pyramid, that, that then um, 
it would be good yeah okay no I mean that's I think that's a it's it's a good way to describe and where we could move uh, and and that is actually not such a big shift as we would expect from you know the 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 results or the issues we're seeing when we have 10 million people in 2050 um, and if, if it means that we have to make some daily adjustments I know we all know that habits are difficult to overcome but yeah. I think that consciousness and awareness is is key and that's something I got um, you know it's it was one of my last questions for you actually in terms of how we how much we do need to shift our mindsets and adjust our worldview um, and obviously that brings me back to let me stop sharing so you actually see me talking as well <laughs> There you go. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, yeah, that brings me kind of to a summary of, uh, and I found that really interesting. And my key takeaways um, for um, you know, in, in terms of questions and how to adjust our mindsets and and and, and be aware about these facts and the f the fact that you put them out there and then and the fact that we discuss them today, I think is crucial. And it's something that just needs to be. Uh, engaged more in a lot of other contexts so it needs to be a little project for younger people yeah. it needs to be exactly that's, that's also, there are lots of other things like vertical farming that's something absolutely amazing um, when I gave my TED talk there was another man giving a TED talk on vertical farming I thought I think that's absolutely wonderful now they're using it for plants that are usually very uh, pesticide intensive so you grow foods indoors and uh, with with light, and if you can use uh, natural light um, uh, from sunlight, or to, to, to power those lamps, then, then that's even wonderful. So you have, and you have people they can uh, the permaculture and food forest, and then we have now this uh, also genetically engineered crops, which are um, um, you can't. What does it say here that you're not? Oh, okay. So the genetically uh, engineered crops. Um, that are helping use less pesticides, but I, I see a major problem with that. And, um, mm. uh, you know, uh, pest resistance has been formed. Um, now there is a new BT um, um, uh, put into crops, um, the, the Bacillus 3. So, yeah, yeah. is there, so, do, you, do you see, I have a question here actually um, from, Emma, and we're gonna just look quickly into what kind of other foods you would suggest um, could be accessible and nutritious. Um, if you if you do look into crops, I mean, if we all go into more legumes or more crops, um, is there an, another alternative you would see? We've we've spoken about a lot of different things now. I think meat and dairy and and crops, but yeah, something, are something we haven't discovered yet, maybe, or not many of us have discovered, but you would know about. Well, there, there are very promising practices that are used for land and um, uh, water management. And uh, one of them is crop rotation. So you could have grains grow and then legumes grow and they put back okay. the nitrogen into the ground. And it also, when, when you do that, it also brings uh, more, uh, increases the microbiome. It, it helps healthy bacteria to grow in the, in the ground, making it more, uh, you know, healthy ground. And, and plants, of, of course, if they're grown in healthy uh, soil, then um, they're more immune to pests mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and more immune to all sorts of environmental, other environmental conditions conditions like heat and uh, water less less water and also um, there are other um, farming practices like um, uh, what is called agroforestry you grow trees in the same plot of land um, and it actually is known to increase yield by 50 percent so um, then people can sell the, the stuff from the trees as well so um, wow okay so there's a whole new ecosystem of things evolving that we could think and water of water harvesting, yeah, yeah. The, uh, maintaining yeah. the water, less irrigation. So there are lots of things that, that, that can be done instead of putting uh, so much fertilizers, also um, making sure that you're, you're doing it, you're adding the fertilizers because the fertilizers, um, they, they then run off into groundwater and into water bodies and cause um, a, a fish to die there. They, have, uh, they take up all the oxygen. They, they don't allow photosynthesis of the sun to shine through and then bacteria grow. And, yeah, they okay. really choke the the fish, so that's also a problem. I I think that um, so fertilizers also uh, 
less use, although we need them because the fertilizers actually um, um, allow us to go from a 4 billion to feeding 4 billion with the use of fertilizers we can now feed our current population, which mm -hmm. we could not have done. So this is really an amazing thing what we'll do okay. with this. Um, okay, that's, yeah, it's a good point to make because I wouldn't have considered that. Obviously, is it? it's a bit like the Industrial Revolution, which got us somewhere, but needs to be adapting a little bit. I, I mean, we need to adapt, yeah. There, there, there is so many possibilities. Now is the time for so many entrepreneurs to make so much uh, uh, money from all these things because uh, really this is the way to go and and Explore government and territory. companies yeah can make can work together there's so much things that can be done um, and what do you what do you think from an individual perspective can someone do um to really be aware of these things so it's another question that we've got here that you know i mean if we want to start adjusting our lifestyle if someone watches this now and thinks okay that's actually a couple of points i haven't been having time to consider yet um where do i start okay so first of all uh, reduce animal product consumption that's number one and then of course uh use go for sustainable transport methods um we can have um, most of the, the greenhouse gas emissions are made from the developed countries. Uh, we have the United States, Europe, and now China. So we, um, we can start to drive smaller cars, electric cars. We can travel less, you know. We don't need to, to make three holidays a year. We can do one holiday or, or, or two. Or a local days. holiday. I mean, there's some nice Local places holidays, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, um, we, yeah, and um, uh, we can um, use, change our lights to LED, LED lamps in the house. And uh, we can also produce less waste. <clears throat> waste is, is, is a big issue because also waste um, landfills uh, use up land. They uh, um, also emit uh, methane. So we can start also using recycled paper. Uh, recycled paper is the fifth largest uh, um, paper is the fifth largest um, industry that that produces um, uh, that uses up most of the energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we can actually is do, use recycled paper. It, it also um, the production of recycled paper uses 65% less energy than uh, manufacturing of paper from raw materials. Also, you'd have to chop down 17 trees to get one ton of recycled paper. So we use recycled paper, use instead of paper towels, use um, real towels. So uh, just, go, just go around your house and check out a few, yeah. a few products and things that you can either avoid or do differently. Yeah, um, even okay. toothbrushes, um, toothbrushes, we're throwing them out, they're made out of plastic, we can mm. uh, um, you we're know. We're using for cleaning, I, that's why I said Yeah, it. exactly, <laughs> we can also use these compost uh, bamboo uh, toothbrushes, which um, are... Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's there's loads of new developments in that space, but I think food is a big part of our life, right? Oh, so food we is have the, most, to, the biggest part. We yeah. have to maybe thinking about that will not just uh, help the planet, but also oh. our long term health. Yeah, and also, after yeah. we get here to to six billion people, we might just make it to ten billion. <laughs> <laughs> Galit, I would uh, um, I would wrap up the session. We've come to uh, over thirty minutes, and okay, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, in case there are more questions, please post them on the website. Still on your session page, Galit, you can still continue the conversation. Uh, we hope that it's you know the more interactive. This is just a start today, so just please. Uh, keep on posting, keep on asking and discussing. Um, again, thanks a lot, Galit. Uh, we have a couple more sessions coming up today. I hope you will also enjoy them from Israel and all viewers from Israel, uh, as well as Europe and, and, and UK and US. And it's been a pleasure to be speaking at DIFF Day 4 today and enjoy the rest. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Galit. Bye-bye. <laughs>